Recovering from last night, the dancing. Fermin is going to dance later on, you know. He's going to set up a show here. Well, we have we have uh, we have Joe on the with us on Skype, uh, and uh, we we like to every every conference we'd like to have a talk where we sort of. Um, give out some ideas, some thoughts about things we think about concept mapping, what we see, what, what, we, what we've uh, thought of the last few years. Uh, Preet Reiska from the Tallinn University has joined us the last, two, the last two times in these discussions. And um, what we've, th this time we're gonna talk a little bit about what is a good CMAP. Now we started, the first time we started in Pamplona, uh, we, we, we emphasize concept mapping as a process. What Professor Moreira was talking about just a couple of hours ago, which is, is concept map is nothing that's static, it's nothing that it's at the end. It's the process of building a map, right? And we call it sort of a concept map based learning environment in which you're, you're working on the concept map as you're learning and this concept map is an iterative process. Um, Okay. Since we're st we're stuck in 2004, this doesn't work. Can get mouse no funciona. Yeah. Uh, in for 2006, we talked somewhat about the fact that 90 something percent of the concept maps that we find are descriptive; they're not explicative. In other words, um, events are also concepts, but most of the time concept maps are based on objects and declarative, and the result is declarative maps. Which don't show much of an explanation. In Estonia, we talked about how after, some, after, after a few years, uh, it was time to start creating the C-mapping community, the C-mappers as we talk ourselves, and the time to consolidate. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen that much. We, we're still not consolidated. There's still a lot to do, but it's still an idea. In Chile, we, we asked ourselves, well, if C maps are so good, why don't we find them everywhere? Why don't we find them in the newspapers trying to explain what's, goes, what, what's going on? Uh, and, and, and why don't we find them out in all kinds of papers and explanations and textbooks and for all types of explanations? And that's still a question we, 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 we ask ourselves. And in, in, in uh, Malta, we discussed how the, the restrictions or freedom you provide students or the concept mapper has an effect on the resulting concept map. Right. Today we're gonna go a little bit further on the same idea of, of content and structure and asking ourselves, how good is my C-map? What makes a good C-map? Uh, and and uh, well, am I a good C-mapper? Do I build good C maps? Um, now the question, the initial question, well, who is asking or why or who asked the question of is this a good C map or is my C map any good? Um, educators are interested in understanding, in meaning. How much does did the student learn? How much does the student understand? Uh, that's really what they're interested in. They don't really care if the C map is Novakian or not, right? Well, it's a mind map. Well, it doesn't matter. It tells me what the student knows. 
Ah, oh, it's got a lot of tech. Well, yes, but what I'm interested in is what, does, what, what is the concept map telling me? So for an educator, maybe a good concept map is not what we think as C mappers is a good concept map. Why? Because we're looking at other characteristics, right? As long as it tells the educator what the educator needs, then it's a good C map. So the question, the question uh, is different. Um, now, as C mappers, those are us who are very strict about concept mapping. Then we're interested in a good C, in a good concept map. Uh, and sometimes we don't even pay that much attention to the content, right? We're in a workshop and say, okay, are the propositions right? Does it look right? Is the hierarchy correct? Uh, do you use the styles nicely? It's a beautiful map. What's the content? Who cares? This is we're learning concept mapping, not content, right? So we go to the other extreme, right? Instead of saying, ah, yeah, the content is good, like the educator thought, no, it's just, it's, it's, isn't that map beautiful? Uh, we did a test on, uh, for the, presented as a poster because it's very, very informal for the conference in Costa Rica, where we showed a lot of people in the community uh, for a few seconds a map where we just uh, sort of hit the content and ask them, is this a good map? Is this a bad map? And everybody was able to answer, and, they, and there was a lot of agreement on what a good map is, and nobody complained and says, where's the content? I cannot see the content. They were still said, okay, yeah, I can tell whether it's a good map or not. Then we have another community, and, and uh, Natasha presented a very interesting paper uh, two days ago. In the business community, where you have a CMAP as a, com a communication tool or a tool within business or as a representation tool, you might come and say, well, why do I care if it represents the expert's knowledge? It's so hard to follow. It's just a mess. And then the knowledge of the center says, yeah, but it's all there. Yes, but it's useless for me. Why? Because it's not a good communication tool. So in that case, it's not whether it's a good CMAP and the content is good, but can I use it within my organization? So all these are issues that that, that we ask ourselves in terms of what is a good CMAP. Then there's other opportunities. I'm working on a, on a project with NASA where we're gonna, we did an app where we're putting several hundreds of maps and hundreds of videos in an app about the asteroid redirect mission and we wanna put this in the app store on an iPad and it's all based on concept maps and hopefully with the NASA promoting it, we can have this on thousands and thousands of iPads and then your, your question is, well, what is a good CMAP to put in this type of circumstance? You have a CMAP for navigating through other types of resources. You want to make sure that the CMAP is great. It's a good CMAP. Well, does it, what does it mean to have a good CMAP in those circumstances? And, you know, we find all kinds of maps. We have several hundred thousand maps in the, in the public CMAP servers. And you've got maps like the top left, right? It's all text. And this is somebody that if I knew where they were, I'd say, please return the tool. Right? You can use something else for this. Uh, or at least pay more. If you're gonna use it for this, pay. Uh, you got maps like the top right, which is sort of a big mixture. Then you have some other maps that sort of look good. And it's interesting because the top, the lower right maps sort of look more like what you would expect to be a concept. No, no, doesn't matter what the content is, but you're sort of biased as to what to expect, right? So you, you got a lot of variety of maps. Huh? You run into some maps and you say, wow, this is a really good map. Why? Why do you say that? What makes you think it's a good map? And then you see some that are terrible. Well, it could be that the top left map has very good content, very good structure, but it doesn't feel like a good concept map. Uh, this is uh, something that I, <laughs> this is a real map that I had to make up because I didn't, never said it. The first time I went to meet with uh, Professor Lea Fagundes uh, to talk about concept maps, when she, was, she still didn't use concept maps. We went to the Colegio de, what was it, the Aplicación, where Italo was working with a map. And we went to see the logo they were doing, and we were very surprised, both of us, Lea and I, because Italo was working with concept maps. And he had been working only a few weeks, right? And the first map he showed was this. And I said, oh my God, this is terrible, right? Because it's, I, I'm gonna translate it. And it was in Portuguese, but it's really, really saying, so you got dinosaurs, and it says, so they lived millions of years ago and they're very big and they're very angry, but then there came a comet and it hit the earth and there was a lot of dust that went up and, uh, and hit the sun and it was very cold and so they all died, right? <laughs> and this was, a pro I don't know, probably a third grader or a second grader. And Lea was ecstatic. This is, this is wonderful. 
And I was thinking, this is terrible. Why? She was saying, this kid is, understands what happens. And I said, yeah, but that's, that, the concepts are not there. No, the concepts are there. She, the kid doesn't have them in different boxes, but that doesn't matter. It's the fact that the kid is telling me that all this happened that matters. So she was looking at a completely different map than I, what I was looking, right? So for her, it was a great map. For me, it was work in progress, a lot of progress still. And, and that just sort of taught me. I, I just said, yeah, she's right. So what is the tool for? Uh, and then uh, even in the literature, and you know, I found some, some maps that some of you will find familiar uh, from, from literature, literature where we, we even have places where they say, well, this is a map that shows only linking to the core concept, no hierarchy, some other ones that are more linear, so there's no, it only shows a temporal sequence. So even, even in the literature, we'll find places where we get some feedback or some comments on the map saying, why is it that this map is good or not? But I, I don't want to get into the details. Um, and some, some time ago, uh, when, when we were starting with the software, um, we, we worked with Joe and say, what about if we add something into the computer that helps the user build better maps? And we called it Joe in a Box. But I'm going to let Joe talk about it and about his rubric. Right. Well, let's see, am I, we are? Well, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, when we first started working with concept maps, the challenge was uh, how, how do you make these things and do the revisions that are needed without exhausting yourself because uh, you keep changing your mind about how to organize the map. And before we had computer software and we were doing all of this with pencil and paper, it was very tedious. But as things progressed, we still found that even starting with paper and pencil, we could begin to recommend ways to make better concept maps. And uh, in their book that we published in 1984, Learning How to Learn, we suggested some things that uh, were criteria for good concept maps, criteria that could be used for scoring. In these criteria, we listed uh, just four things. Is there a good hierarchy in the concept map? That is, are there distinct levels of abstraction and generalizability? Are the propositions good? Are, are they valid statements? Each proposition should be a statement that has meaning and it should be valid. Another criterion was how many concepts are there? So we proposed a scoring scheme that would count how many levels of hierarchy and score each level at five points. Whereas the concepts, if they were valid, we scored those at one point. And then if there were crosslinks, which we encouraged people to do, we scored those at 10 points. Now, I tried to emphasize uh, both in learning how to learn and in talks about scoring concept maps is that there's no one perfect scoring scheme, and you need to develop a scoring scheme that's right for your purposes. For example, we did a project in nutrition, and we scored concepts one point each, but if they included the concept cholesterol, we scored that five points because that was such a key concept. And there are a couple other concepts that we scored five points 
because there were key concepts to understanding good nutrition. So I think it's, there's no simple rule book that's going to work for every purpose, for every concept map. Now, in our early work, we did not emphasize the importance of a focus question. But we came to recognize this increasingly as time went on. And now the software at IHMC asks for the focus question when you go to save concept map. So if the map maker didn't start with a concept and with a focus question, the software asks them to come up with a focus question. And then you could step back and say, does this concept map really answer this focus question? Alberto and I did a session on this because so often the focus questions are either missing or poorly constructed. And this is an indication that the map maker doesn't really understand the subject matter. I found in working with Procter & Gamble teams creating new products that the most important job we had to do was to come up with a good focus question. What is this thing, this team trying to create? What is it that is the goal of this research effort? And initially we spent a whole morning trying to come up with a good focus question, going back and forth between the presenter and the various participants who were part of the research team. We later found we could streamline this by talking with the group leader and coming up with two or three tentative focus questions and then discussing these with the audience, with the researchers. This way we could converge to a good focus question in maybe 20 minutes or a half hour instead of three hours. And there was much more time then to work on creating a good concept map for the problem that team was working with. So how do you score the quality of a focus question? That's a, a problem we've never really solved with any good answers because it's so dependent on the project and the purpose of the map. But we do ask that people look at this issue Another thing we found that was very important is the, the use of crosslinks. Now, it's possible to link any concept on a concept map with another concept on that map, but the propositions that would be formed would be either trivial or maybe even meaningless. To find good crosslinks, cross crosslinks that a new insight into the subject matter and a new insight into an answer for the focus question is a very difficult thing to do. But when we see this, it's a good indication that this person not only has mastered some of the knowledge required to understand the topic, but that the person is capable of doing creative work on the topic. And we found with PhD students, when they concept back the thesis project, the cross links on their thesis project were essentially the fundamental questions addressed in the thesis. Moving along, we tried to develop some uh, small videotapes to deal with some of these questions. Alberto and I worked together to create a series of these, asking questions like, what is a concept? Because one has to become clear that not every word is a concept label. And that some concepts are more significant, more powerful, more heuristic in their potential than other concepts. We raised the question about how one goes about restructuring 
concept maps. And with computer software, it's so easy now to modify and reconstruct a concept map. Imagine dealing with a concept map with 100 or 200 concepts and having to modify it in a major way with paper and pencil. It's enough to have you just say, I give up <laughs> trying to do anything with this. Whereas now with the software, it's manageable. Not that we recommend making concept maps at large, but on occasion, there is a value in a large concept map. For example, we did concept maps passed for biology researchers, and we wanted to combine the map for each research project into one comprehensive concept map. We wound up with a concept map that had some 200 concepts on it. But within that, you could see the domains of the researchers clustered in areas. And when we began to look for crosslinks between those domains of research, the researchers were finding they were getting new insights on how to proceed in their own research, how to improve and modify their research program because of a crosslink that gave them a new insight in building from this domain to that domain a new connection and therefore a new insight. Well, I'm going to turn this back to Alberto and uh, we'll be available for questions. I hope you'll have some questions for us as uh, we move along. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. So in the, in the Joe in the box, what we were trying to do was to take some of this experience that we had generated through, through several years, and it never got to the public version of CMAP tools because uh, it didn't work very well. In fact, uh, it had some interesting loops in it. it. It got recommendations on how to improve the map, and sometimes it asked you to make a change, and eventually it asked a suggestion that changed the map to its original status, and, and things like that. Um, but, but we had some criteria uh, that, that are listed here. We don't have to go through all of them because they're, they're really quite, you'll be familiar with them. Like, a context for the concept map should be defined commonly with the stated explicit focus question. And, and we have done work, and I've, uh, there's some work that we did with uh, Natasha, who's somewhere here, and Frank Safayeni on the importance of a good focus question in the resulting map, whether it's static or dynamic. Concept labels in maps should be a one or a few words. Linking lines should be labels. Well, we've got linking phrases, hierarchical organization. In general, some of the ideas about concept maps that we all manage. There are, there are two points that really came through. Uh, one was, Okay, so we, we had these conditions, and these conditions were necessary but not sufficient. In other words, following these conditions does not guarantee that you get a good concept map. And that's, just one, of the, that, that's one of the questions that we ask ourselves, so, so what is a good concept map, right? And the other thing was, there's two parts to it. There's the content and there's the structure. The graphical structure, right? topology, the, the organization, the hierarchy, and the content. So let's look at, at these. So if a concept map consists of graphical structure and content, then it's easy to say then, then a good concept map must have a good structure and good content. So if we assess the structure and we assess the content, we get a good concept map, right? Um, so we're going to use this axis to sort of try to, to to, to understand what, where this takes us, we got a quality of the content in the x-axis, quality of structure in the y-axis. And we asked ourselves, so what does the community think is a good structure and what is a good content? Uh, the graphical structure, of course, is the easiest. And there was anybody who's sort of computer scientist that goes into concept mapping immediately sees the opportunity of using everything in graph theory and networks and apply it. Doesn't matter if it works or not, but it's easy to apply. And you get a number and you can publish. And the number probably doesn't mean anything, but it's, it's, it's attractive and gets work done. Um, 
So because if you have, for example, you say, okay, in the, in the, in the criteria, you talk about the hierarchical structure of knowledge leads to hierarchical C maps. Well, I mean, you also have cyclic maps and you have other possibilities. Then, okay, let's, let's measure the hierarchy. That's easy. Cross-links show understanding, and Joe just mentioned it on the work with uh, Proctor and Gamble and the work with astrobiology. Okay, so let's find cross-links. So it lends itself to something that's very simple, which is falling in the trap of believing that these structural components provide a valid assessment. If it's hierarchy and cross-links, let's measure hierarchy and cross-links. We get the numbers, great. Uh, so I go back to a, 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 a review that was presented in Malta, which is not comprehensive, but its coverage is enough of the different types of scoring mechanisms uh, that, it's, that's, that, that it, it more or less covers everything there is. And, and this is a better view of the table. No attempt to you be able to read this. Otherwise, it, well, anyway, it would take you too long to read it. But we took, we took this and uh, uh, and I just want to make uh, uh, the reference to the, the fact that Beat this morning presented another sort of organization of these scoring mechanisms. And basically, it's, this, it's, it's more or less the scoring mechanisms. You can add a few and organize it different ways, but it's basically the same scoring mechanisms that you find in the literature. It's quite consistent with what you find elsewhere. And what we find is that Okay, so this is what happens when you move from a Mac PowerPoint to a Windows PowerPoint, right? Things are not aligned, everything breaks. It used to look nicer. Uh, so you count number of concepts. Okay, that's easy, easy to do. Number of propositions, number of levels of hierarchy, concepts per level, frequency of branching, number of constraints, number of strands, number of examples, diameter of a graph, maximum degree of concepts, spanning tree of the map, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all measures that sort of makes sense, right? And so they're easy to do, they're easy to, to, to consider, so we just use it. And the aim is at providing a score. High score, good CMAP. Low score, bad CMAP. Easy, right? Uh, content is probably a little bit more difficult, right? How do you, how do you express? Well, there, there are three things only in a concept map, addition to, to the focus question, but in the structure, you got the concept, you got the linking phrase, and they form propositions. Not that bad. All you have to do is asset, assess those. So we assess them. And again, from the same source, we got quality of the concepts. OK, are the concepts good? Completeness of the concepts used. Quality of the concept labels. Completeness of relationships. So these are all from this, from this review that was presented in Malta. Proposition correctness. Proposition quality. Correctness plus validity. Propositions depth of explanation, correct propositions that are not present in the expert's concept map. Many of these assume that there's an expert concept map, the teacher's map, because of course the teacher knows how to make the good map, right? That one is really good. Uh, proposition relevance, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's usually an emphasis on good propositions, right? Because it, it provides more information, more assessment than, than just the concepts. Again, the aim is at providing a score. High score, good CMAP. So good concept maps need to have good structure. They need to have good content. So we set up this table and say, OK, so if you only have good structure, let's call it level one. It's a poor map. If you have only good content, let's call it level one poor map. Why? Because to be a good CMAP, you have to have good structural quality and good content quality. And we call that level two, it's good CMAP. So, what does this lead us? Well, I'm going to show you just a few examples, but you can imagine what happens. So this is, a, this is a level one poor concept map, which has a good structure according to the rubrics, but it's got a poor content. And this is from the work that, uh, that, that Soika and Reska are doing out of a collection of, I don't know, what is it, 1,700 maps or whatever that are being evaluated. And, and, and so you'd say, but that's a bad structure. It's got more than one root, and that doesn't look right. And you, as a good CMAP, you say, yeah, that's strange. That's not a, well, rubrics don't care about that, usually. Right? You count number of concepts. You count number of hierarchies. It doesn't matter if the hierarchy is sort of, the, because you're not looking at the overall map. You're, you're looking at pieces. So overall, you end up finding that uh, this is, most rubrics will tell you this is a good map. And if you look at it, eh, it's pretty bad, but you don't think of it, it's a good map, but the rubrics will tell you. And then the content in this one does appear, uh, the, the, the propositions are not good, 
uh, it, it's not complete or whatever. So this would be a map that would fit somewhere around here. Probably not perfect structure, uh, but pretty bad quality. So within this, 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 this graph, it, I'll just give an area because it depends on which rubrics you use, but somewhere around there you would get this, this, this map. And then you would say, okay, this is another one. Uh, it's got good content. According to the evaluation with these rubrics, it's got good content. Okay, this has propositions that are good, the, con the a complete set of concepts or whatever, but it's got a poor structure. For example, it doesn't have crosslinks. In most cases, not having crosslinks just brings the score down, right? So again, we got a level one map. Why? Because it doesn't have a good structure, it doesn't have crosslinks. So I'll just put this somewhere around here, right? It's a, it's close to good in, in the, the level of content, but somewhat low in the, in the structure. Right? Uh, so what would be a good theme map? Okay, one would be, okay, if it's got a good content, good structure, we get up here. We got a theme map, and whoever, whoever created it is a good theme mapper. Let's take an example. This is, I think this is the example that Norma Mille presented with the games. This is a game where the, the students in Panama, elementary school students, were given two concepts and they had to fill a proposition and they were in two teams, so each team had to validate each other's team. So it was a team validation of the quality of the propositions. The content was about comics, so the kids were very knowledgeable. It's a comic that every kid knew, so they were experts on the subject. So if you go and evaluate the quality of the propositions, they're all very good. All the concepts are there. The structure will give you all kinds of interesting things, but it's a terrible map. It doesn't say anything. It was built it's just a network of propositions that doesn't explain anything, right? Why? Because it wasn't built as a map. It doesn't, it doesn't have the qualities of the map. The propositions were good, but the rubrics will tell us it's got very good structure, and the rubrics will tell us it's got very good content. So where do we put this map? Oh, it's a good map, right? So according to most of the rubrics, that will qualify as a good map, even though there's no cohesion in the propositions. There's no cohesion in the content. The, 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 the structure doesn't make any sense. This is another example and, um, uh, from, from the work from uh, Minces, Pearsall and Minces. This shows two maps drawn by the same college biology student at the beginning of the semester, and that's at the end of the semester. And you would say, wow, this student really knew, knows a lot, right? So if you take, a, if you assign, if you go and, and, and measure this, this, the structure of this map, it says, oh yeah, it's over the top, it's got everything. If you go and measure most of the propositions, it'll do very well, but it's got key problems in terms of understanding and a lot of misconceptions. I mean, there's some misunderstandings that if you look at the overall map and you understand the subject, it's bad, it's wrong, it's a bad map. But all the rubrics will tell you, great, one more up there, another good map. So this is a danger, part of the danger of, of saying, yeah, okay, so we, 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 we're, we're assessing the maps, they're good, but are they really good? So how good is my C map? Well, it's easy, actually not that easy to fool all these rubrics and make maps that have good structure and good content. Particularly if students knew what we were assessing, that would be very easy. Um, so if you have a good graphical structure and you have good content, you got a good C map. So most of the maps we find are somewhere around here within that gray area. Most of the maps we find are, they might be bad in one, bad in the other. And in general, when we, as educators, we tend to move students on this way because what we're interested in is that they show increased understanding. Most, most, most of the time we want to, to, want to understand what, they're, what they know, not so much can they make better structures. So we tend to move over on the on the x on the x axis, basically. Uh, we we were, I mean, a lot of people ask me why doesn't CMAP tools provide an assessment? We have an assessment tool. It's called CMAP Analysis. We presented it in Chile. It is extendable. You can add new versions for it, and that's the one we're using to analyze 1,700. I don't know how many maps that project that does all this. It's very simple to do this assessment, but we don't want the software to provide a number because then the teachers would say, oh yes. Computer sets, it's eight out of 10, that's a great, right? So, so all these assessments and this, this, this rubrics, are not, they're not difficult to implement. 
So I, I came this, with this up when I, we were writing the paper, and I said, somebody must have said it. So I went on the Google and looked for it, and I didn't find it, so I attributed it to myself. And so it says, well, anyone can write lines of verse, but that doesn't make a poem, right? Uh, and the idea is, sure, everybody can write concept maps, but doesn't make a good C-mapper. So we came up with another level, and for lack of a better term, we're calling it an excellent map. We tried several, and it doesn't, none of them fit well, so we're still looking. And, and, the, and the issue is, it's not only the structure, it's not only the content, it's the overall map. It's the quality of the map that we're interested in, really. Not so much the quality of each of the individual components. So we say, let's, if we go with the comparison of the poem, it's like a good poem. If you read one, you recognize it, but you can't say, well, it's because it's got so many words. Yeah, that makes it a good poem. It's got so many, no, it's not. There's something about it that makes it good. What is it? Hard to tell. So we came up with this, okay, so we need an excellent structure, we need an excellent content, and that takes us to an excellent map. Now the hard time, the, hard, the, the difficult part, and I'll tell you, we don't have the answer, is so what takes us up there? How do you get up to that corner from where we are? First place, the first thing we ask ourselves, and Joe mentioned it many times, is does the map answer the focus question? And none of the rubrics that we found really, well, maybe a couple, ask that question. Does the map answer the focus question that the teacher intended? Second, it's, it's sort of difficult to explain, but when I look at a map, I try to see what does the map tell me? What's the understanding of the student? What's, how much does the student know? How much does the person who wrote the map or constructed the map know? What does it tell me? Does it explain things clearly? Does it show meaning? Does it show understanding? Uh, that's, not, that's not a network. Understanding is not a network of propositions. No, it's more than that. Does it communicate well? I added that after listening to Natasha's talk two days ago. Does it communicate the ideas to somebody else? Now, a good map responds to a focus question. Okay, so yeah, it, it, it responds, it answers the question. There's a distinction with an excellent map because we say it explains that response in a clear fashion. So it doesn't only respond, but it's clear. It's well organized, it's well expressed. How do you measure that? I don't know, but it does, right? And you, and you can think of maps that do that. Okay, that's clear. What does it mean that it's clear? What does it mean that it's good explanation as opposed to just responding? An excellent map is concise. And by concise, although we'll show you some small maps, it doesn't mean it's small. It does, what it means is that all concepts and propositions should be relevant. Why do we say that? Because there are many maps with irrelevant concepts and irrelevant propositions. Why? Because you just, you just keep on adding concepts and propositions and, they, and don't they don't really contribute to the explanation. So it doesn't include unnecessary concepts. It doesn't include unnecessary propositions and it doesn't include crosslinks. And actually, for a topic, it's much more difficult to make a good, clear, small map, concise map, that does just keep on adding the concepts because it's easier. And then you tend up adding, answering more than the focus question, but then it's not a clear explanation because you're answering a lot more, right? It does not miss any key relevant concept propositions or crosslinks. So it doesn't have anything that are necessary but it's not missing anyone, any of the concepts, propositions, or cross-links that are key. And the cross-links are somewhat difficult. Uh, Jeff Briggs, who was in the conference in Costa Rica, who did one of the largest uh, first knowledge models that, that, that we worked on when he was at NASA, he was the director of the Center for Mars Exploration, when he was working on the top-level map, which is this one on Mars, which I don't expect you to, to, to read, he was saying that he spent a lot of time on it. He says, it's not that I, I can't find which concepts to link. I can link any concept with any other concept in this map. They're all linkable. It's finding the ones that, the cross-links that would link to propositions which were, had a clear explanation and that would contribute to the explanation. In other words, which are the really key cross-links? Which are the propositions that are needed? 
it's not just a matter of start linking everything and because, it, because it can be linkable, right? And actually, his, 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 uh, the map he came up with was very readable, very good. Beginners, on the other hand, have a hard time starting to build maps. Once they start building maps, they just, then, then they grow and make large maps, right? Uh, they just tend to make them more complex, and they just think of other things. They include a large number of concepts, propositions, and linked inferences, many of which are usually irrelevant. And at least in my experience, they very often end up with what would be a good concept map according to the rubrics, but does not answer the focus question. It's about something else. It's a something tangible, close to the area, but it's not really answering the question that I asked. Now, if I never asked the question, if I never gave them a focus question, then I'd never know whether they, it answered the question. And unfortunately, very often, we don't ask the focus question. Now, the structural and content criteria are interesting because most of them max reward maximizing each criteria. In other words, you say, I count, you saw the number of concepts. Okay, more concepts, better. More propositions, the better. So let's, let's just add more. So they reward quantity. Uh, and more complex concept maps do not necessarily provide a greater insight into the meaning. It doesn't, a larger map doesn't necessarily mean that the student understands better. That's not the case. On the other hand, the problems with the, most of the rubrics is that the measurements are taken independently. In other words, I measure the quality of each proposition, but I don't measure the cohesion of the propositions. Now, how do we measure the cohesion of the propositions? Well, that's the work we need to do, but it's not that each proposition is correct. Many cases in the, uh, the rubrics evaluate whether the proposition is true or false. It might not have anything to do with a concept map. It's true, yes, but it's about something else. It's not relevant, it's not answered, but it's true or false. And you count the number of true propositions. They're valid, yeah, they're valid, but in another context, right? So you're just counting and counting. So when you use the criteria, you're, you're, you're rewarding maximizing the criteria. In an excellent map, it's different. Now, how do we measure the optimal number of concepts? I don't know, but there should be an optimal, right? It makes sense. Not too many, not too few. Um, how many propositions, how many linking phrases? There has to be an optimal balance there. And, and, and I, as I say, the, other, the idea of this talk is we start thinking about this. Okay, what is the optimal? Uh, actually leads to another question for another, that'll be another talk somewhere else, something that I'm working on, which is, because I get this question a, a lot, how large should my CMAP be? Should it be bigger, should it be smaller? Should I keep on adding things? And that happens a lot with students and with uh, workshops, right? Should, should I add more? Is it okay now? Am I done? Is, it, is this large enough? And the question is, is it large enough? Not whether, is it, is, is, does it explain well? So this optimal is related to, well, how large should it be? So an excellent map would be one that has high clarity. Okay, what does high clarity mean? I don't know, but it makes sense, right? Sort of feels good. Has a clear message. Yes, a clear message. Communicates key ideas. And if we're, if we're in, in education, this is very important because for most subjects, there are one, two, one or two or three key ideas. That's all. There's not, there's not hundreds of ideas. I mean, you're in a topic, there's only a couple, two or three key ideas, and you want to make sure that the student understands those key ideas, communicates those key ideas, and if we know what those key ideas are, then we can assess them. Now, we don't assess them by counting propositions. No, that's not key ideas. It's different. The ideas are ideas. And, it, and an excellent map is usually the result of an iterative process. You don't get an excellent map the first time you do it. You redo it, you think about it, you add more, you take out, you put it away, you put, come back. Uh, uh, and that's, so, so it's part of a process to get there. So a couple of maps that I think are, are on the way to excellent, if not excellent, but I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, in honor of Joe, Joe's concept map about concept maps, right? That's one that we get, and then Joe, I don't know if Joe can hear what I'm saying, but it's, it's all the time that we're getting uh, request to be able to, to, to use this, this map, which is in one of our papers, as a, as a reference. I mean, a lot of people like the map. They want to use it. They're always in the papers, in their books, whatever. 
that means that they, that they like it. It explains. It makes sense to them. This is another map that I want to show. That's part of a work we did with NASA, uh, which is very, it's very concise. And, it, and it's, I think it's a good explanation. And uh, literally, it took us a group of about five or six of us, including Joe. Joe was there. Uh, two astronauts, one of which was a, a scientist who walked on the moon, and a couple of other experts from NASA, and a couple of people of the institute, and we spent about six hours debating basically on the linking phrases. Uh, can't read that. Why? Because linking phrases are key. For example, it says, Sustain U.S. human exploration of the solar system advances international collaboration. That advances was a discussion about an hour. Because some people, it says, no, it should say that it confirms American leadership. Well, yeah, but you got, you got the partners in Europe. That, that's not what you want to say. What is it that you want to say? We want to say that we're ahead and we want to confirm it. That's a completely different proposition than advances international collaboration. Right? And, and, and there were heated discussion about each of those thinking phrases for many hours, after which we came back and changed them again. Okay. And then it changed again. But it just shows that very, but very often, just to make a small map, that really summarizes the, why the, US, the United States should continue exploring space, can take a long time, but you end up with a map that's very nice, concise, but it takes time. And, and that's part of getting to build an excellent map. So, conclusion, it's somewhere beyond rubrics. We can't stay with this idea that the rubrics give us all this information. There are lots of them. And every time we come to a conference, somebody else invented another version, another combination of another rubric. I'm not saying rubrics are bad. They take us to a certain level. What I'm saying is, can't count on the rubrics to tell us whether there's understanding or not, because they actually don't tell us that. Uh, so even if we can assess very many single criteria, that doesn't tell us what the map is excellent. It doesn't tell us the key ideas, the clarity, the conciseness, all this that we like to get. Of course, we're being very uh, uh, C-mappy in the sense that we want everybody to build concept maps. I sound like the, remember, the, the, the grammar teacher in, in sixth grade that wanted your, your, your text to be perfect grammatically, all right? So this is sort of grammatically nice and, and pretty and well organized, sort of the same idea. So we're still discussing. Um, what, what does it mean to have an excellent map in a quantitative manner? What, what, do you, what does it mean to get to a map to level three? And what we wanted to do is just sort of put these ideas in your mind and say, yeah, there's a little bit more. Can we do a little bit more? What can we do about it? So if you go up, if you get up there, then you're an excellent sea mapper. How many here consider yourselves to be excellent sea mappers? One. Two, three, two. I guess everybody was waiting to see if somebody raised their hand, right? We should come, we should bring them over here and uh, demo. Uh, so, so an excellent C map is a good poem. We said that. The professional mapper, the excellent mapper, can recognize those good C maps. Yeah, I, you can probably say, yeah, this is an excellent map. But it's hard to teach him teach how to construct them, right? And how to, it's hard to explain why it's an excellent map. But we can recognize them. We're able to recognize them. Thank you very much. I guess there could be questions, right?